Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Right Sewing Needle for Every Project webinar. We're so excited you're joining us today. You can submit questions anytime by typing them in the questions pane um, in your control panel, and you can send those anytime throughout the presentation. We'll get those answered at the very end. Also note that this webinar is being recorded for you. I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Bernina educator, Sylvain Bergeron. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk needles today. So uh, as you know, your sewing machine can be the fanciest or the simplest. It's the needle that does the stitching, right? So I have a sample of needles for you. Before we start, uh, you don't really need to take notes today because uh, I have a couple of handouts for you that you can download. The first one is a list of resources. It's a PDF, so you can click on the links and go right to the websites accordingly. Uh, your uh, PDF reader, whichever your application you use, may ask you, are you okay following links from this document? I would say yes, so that will take you to the resources. The second handout is uh, provided courtesy of Schmitz Needles. Uh, Rod Pierce, who works for Schmitz Needles here in the US, uh, is a colleague of mine, and I met her on the walking path in my subdivision recently, and when I mentioned to her I wanted to offer this for download, she was gracious enough, and it's also just been updated, so this is the latest and the freshest. That It's a just two page, and it has all the common types of needles for you with quick information for uh, identification. So that'll be for that. Uh, the materials I'm covering today is pretty much based on a blog post, and I will show you on the web browser in a bit, a blog post that was about the five common types of needles I use in my sewing room. So all the key information, the size recommendations and all that is in this blog post, so you don't have to write everything down. And there'll be a couple of extra bits that I will show you uh, further down the road. So uh, let's begin. We're gonna begin with a poll. Megan, if you can pull the first poll, it's a poll on the brands of sewing machine needles that you use currently. If you use multiples, that's all good. Uh, just to get an idea of what people are working with. Uh, I use all of those. So uh, those are Bernina Schmetz, Oregon Superior, and there's uh, some other brands out there that are less commonly known but are still available. So while you fill the poll, I'm going in after uh, we close the poll, I will show you just a few slides to recap what makes a sewing machine needle. So Megan, let's let's go ahead and switch to the slides. Okay, so for the slides. Go ahead and share your screen, Sylvain. Oh, yes, yes, thank you, forgot about that. There we go, are we there? You are good to go. Okay, cool. So uh, this, this is taken from the blog post, by the way. So the anatomy of a needle is, you have the shank at the top, that's the flat back for household sewing machines. Uh, commercials can be round, right? But household machines are flat at the back. And then down the shaft of the needle, in the front, there's a groove. And the groove is for the thread to slide up and down the needle. And then at the bottom, you'll see the eye where the thread comes from the front, goes through the eye, out the back of the needle. That's the natural intended orientation, if you want, for the needle for sewing. There's also the point of the needle. The point is strategic. It really affects how the needle will enter that fabric. So we'll talk about points along the way. We'll, all, we'll talk about grooves, of course, and the eye itself is also important. Some needles, like a top stitch needle, typically is used with thicker, much thicker thread. Think that heavy yellow jeans thread. So the eye of the needle typically will affect how the thread flows. It can be taller, wider, and there's a limit to how big you can make an eye because if it's too big, the needle will become too weak. So if you need a bigger eye, at some point you need to up the size of your needle. Now the back of the needle, so if you look at the back, at this point the thread is coming behind that needle, away from you, you don't see it, it's coming through the eye and it's coming at you. But right above the eye, there is a, a little bump here. If you hear a machine needle, especially in embroidery, you hear a thunk sometimes when the needle's coming back up and you start hearing thunk, 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 thunk. Typically it's right above the eye here, there's a little protuberance that will snag. When that happens, you may need to use a bigger needle. So the, sh the scarf here is a, not a cutout, but a skinny uh, portion of the needle. This is where the hook comes and the hook grabs the loop of thread right in this area here as the needle starts pulling up from down below. So that's for the anatomy of a needle. 
key points here is the eye, the groove, and the point, and that the needle likes to sew forward. That's the preferred direction of sewing. Next, talking of direction of sewing, I ran a quick and dirty little sample. This is on a muslin, greatly magnified, as you can see. Uh, what I did is I did a satin stitch, and I did it forward. Now, uh, this example is to show two things. One, I did not have quite the right needle. So you can see that my tension on the forward direction, this is how you would normally sew a satin stitch. There's a few little few boo-boos here. And you can tell that the needle got deflected and left a gap. The point was not sharp. And we'll talk about the points across the different styles of needles. So the point was not quite right for a satin stitch. For a satin stitch, you want a sharp needle. Like a jeans needle is great for that. You can use a microtex. You can use a, a, also a top stitch needle if you want. But that being said, you can tell this satin stitch on the right is pretty even. Most of the, sti the stitches lay pretty much as a very clean stack. Any little di uh, discrepancies here were due to the needle point, and they're greatly magnified. If you look at the, the warp and the weft here. This is a fine muslin, so this is greatly magnified. Now take the same stitch and sew it backwards. I just moved over, engaged a permanent reverse function, and sew the exact same settings, and that does not look good. Because, and I will, I'll do the little puppet show in a second. What happens is that when you sew in reverse direction, when the needle comes out of the fabric, it's actually having to jump over the thread that it just laid down and the loop that it created for the stitch to form. So the needle is playing skip rope with its thread. When you sew forward, it's leaving any previous stitch and any thread behind. So you get a nice smooth delivery. But when you sew backwards, the, the needle doesn't like it. It's not designed for that. So you see it affected tension and you can see this looping, this twisting of the thread. That is because the machine was sewing backwards. If you remember your old, old sewing machines, when you did a buttonhole, in the old days, the buttonhole on most machines, well, pretty much all of them, would do the first bead of the buttonhole sewing forward. And then it would do the bar tack at the front and it would reverse and sew the second bead backwards. And your beads never looked even. Bernina was the first brand to introduce both beads in the same direction. In 1986, the computerized machines would basically sew a straight stitch backwards on the second bead and then sew it forward in the same direction with a zigzag. So they would be even that way. So this is not your machine. It's not your thread. It's the needle that is designed to sew in a forward direction. Now, uh, talking of needles, before we move on to the details, some people, I, I've been teaching sewing for 20 years. Sometimes my mother has uh, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. So she has a hard time with those tiny little screws. Her machine has this, what we call thumb screw on the bottom of the slide. Those I like because you never need to reach for the screwdriver. But if you have uh, sensitive fingertips or like in the case of my mother, advanced arthritis, she can't use that screw without a tool. So there's a company that makes what they call screw key dudes. You can get them from your local store. They are basically a little wrench, if you want a plastic socket, that will fit on top of this thumb screw in this case. And the screw key do number two has basically a little Torx screwdriver at the tip that replaces the little gray screwdriver for the current machines. If you have an older, older machine, like my old 1260 Bernina from the 90s, that had a gray screwdriver with a black blade that was a flat head with a poker in the middle, right? I use that on my machines. I like it. I do not know if there's a screw key do for those older machines. But for the all current Berninas, whether you have this type of needle clamp screw or that type, the, the thumb screw, there is an additional tool you can get. Not made by Bernina, but works great on Berninas. Love, love those screw key do's. Now, these needle clamp screws are the ones you see when you put your needle in. And you know, you loosen them up, put the needle back up into the socket, and then tighten them. You notice here that there is a wedge at the very tip of the screw. That is the wedge that will gradually put pressure on the back of that needle, the flat side, that will squeeze it into the clamp and hold it tight. So if you ever over tighten the screw like crazy, like maybe your husband did that, you could mash that, but the screw is easily replaceable. It's very rare that that will happen, so don't worry about it. But with these tools, you get a little more torque. So fewer turns, you get there, you get to tighten the screw nice and easy. 
So we're done with the slides. I will go back to uh, camera view. And we are uh, going to do the poll results, Megan, for Yes. So you, ha you had 44% say Bernina, 90% said they use Schmetz, 29% uh, said Organ, 15% said Superior, and 3% said Other. Cool. So yeah, Bernina does not make its own needles. They're made by a Swiss company in Switzerland for Bernina, like the neighbors. Uh, they're just as good quality as all the others. Uh, actually, they're probably the best quality needle because the Swiss are a little uh, insistent on precision. Uh, Schmetz, I will show you all my samples today are Schmetz. Uh, I've been using Schmetz since I started sewing. Uh, they're excellent needles and Schmetz offers a wide variety. Uh, there will be tools online in that handout the first, the, the handout with the resources goes to the Schmetz education page, if you want, where they have all the information about the different types of needles, including the handout, the Schmetz handout that you can download from there. So uh, that'll be a good place to go. And I will show you in a while the Bernina needle selector, where you can choose your fabric and application, and it will give you uh, the, the suggest the right type of needle to use for that, because the type is first and foremost. And the word application, if you talk to the needle people, the companies that make needles, the word application is everything. They don't care so much about the fabric, it's the application. Is it on lightweight fabric? Is it on coated fabric? Is it, and what kind of stitching are you going to do? So it's all about the application and the handouts are written that way. So that being said, let's jump into the meat and potato section. I'm going to show you some needles, okay? Uh, first, a lot of us sew cotton. Quilters, you know, piecing, shirt making. Megan is an exquisite garment maker, so she uses those as well. Uh, any kind of basic cotton, whether it's what they used to call top weight or bottom weight, I use a jeans needle. The jeans needle, when you, here's the way the needle works. My finger is going to be the needle for now. The thread I said comes down the front, out the back, and then the point is what goes into the fabric, and the eye lets the, the thread flow through the needle, right? So, that thread, when the needle goes into the fabric, it's pulling the thread down with it. It's yanking thread from the tension, right? It's pulling it down. So it's creating this V from the last stitch you did, the needle's coming down and it's pulling. So there's thread back here. And then the needle's pulling down and there's thread coming from the top of the machine. So it's creating this V. As soon as the needle pulls out of the fabric, it starts pulling up. It's not out of the fabric yet. As it starts pulling up, that thread was back here, leaves a loop. It creates a slag because this thread here is staying put for the time being. The needle is sliding and retracting, leaving the thread behind for a minute, fraction of a second. So that leftover thread is the loop that the hook swings and grabs right off the back of the needle, right where the scarf is. And then it forms the stitch. Then the needle keeps going up and the take-up lever finishes pulling up that thread to take the slack off. So when you thread your machine all that, that thread goes through the needle back and forth several times. And actually, I have a little video to show you that will show exactly that process. So Megan, let's switch to the video. Give me one second, let me switch here. Yeah, yeah we have to switch the, switch the mode, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. To trace the thread and when it will enter the needle, I just put a little red dot with a permanent marker near the spool. Next, I will sew until that red marker proceeds through the machine and reaches the needle. And then I will focus on how many times it goes in and out of the fabric. I have now reached the point where the red marker is right above the needle here. So I will now use the needle up and down button to show you that here is the red marker on my thread. It has not gone through the needle yet. And as the take up lever finishes the stitch, this will pull back up. So it will do this several times, but you'll notice that it gets closer to the needle every time. Notice that we are now at the needle clamp. This has not gone through the needle eye yet.
So you notice now that the red marker is very close to the needle eye, so in a few stitches it will make it through. On the next stitch, it will now enter the needle eye for the first time. You see now that it is touching the needle eye. I will keep going. This I will now count my stitches. I counted 15 stitches between the moment the red marker first entered the needle eye and when it actually stayed down in the fabric and did not come up again. So that means that in this case, that with this stitch length, the thread, the same point on the thread, passes the needle 15 times before it stays into the fabric. That's friction on your thread. So having the right needle type for the thread fabric types and the weights that you're using is very important to ensure free passage of that thread and not fraying it in the process. Oops. There you go. Okay, uh, Megan, you see, I, I'm back on, right? You can see me? Yep, yep, you're good to go. It's just you. Good, good. Okay, so the first and foremost thing you want to do is always a needle type because the type affects the groove, how deep the groove will be into the needle for the thread to flow freely. For instance, in embroidery, when you sew over 20,000 stitches, there's a lot of thread on thread friction. When you sew a garment, it's a straightforward seam. It's through nice cotton. That's pretty low stress on your thread and your needle. Uh, and then when you, know, when you do like heavy thread, you want a top stitch needle because the groove is deeper. So let's go through the different types of needles, the basic ones. There are more, I can't cover everything in about half an hour, but that will cover most applications in the sewing room. So I was talking about the jeans needle. The jeans needle has a sharp point, very sharp. It will go through cotton and it will give you a crisp seam because wherever it lands, it will give you a straight seam. Uh, the groove is deep enough, the shank of that needle is a bit stronger than the average. They've made it, uh, not the shank, but the, well, the, the whole shaft of the needle is a little stronger. That way that needle can take heavy denim when you get to hemming and stuff like that. So it's a sharp point, gives you a precise. You wanna do satin stitch, like I just showed you a sample. If you do a satin stitch with a jeans needle on a canvas or a twill, you know a twill has a bias, right? It's woven on a diagonal. There's a diagonal pattern to it. So if you do a, like a universal or a ballpoint needle and you try to do satin stitch, every time it crosses over a certain fiber, like a ridge in the fabric, your satin stitch will, the edges will jog a little bit. If you use a jeans needle, it will pierce the fabric no matter what, where it landed, and you will get a perfectly smooth bead of satin stitch on both sides. So that's for the jeans needle. It's very good for uh, you know a size 70 for piecing quilts. That's what my colleague Nina McVeigh uses. Uh, I use, when I made shirts, I would use an 80. If I made pants, I may use an 80, but when it's time for hemming, I would switch maybe to a 90 if it was heavier. But the type, the point is first, the type of needle will also accommodate the thread, and the eye usually is sized and shaped to work with that type of fabric and applications. So jeans needle is very good. Next is stretch or ballpoint needles. They used to be called ballpoint. Terminology is shifting over time, but the principles stay the same. So the ballpoint is called stretch today. It's pretty much interchangeable. A medium ballpoint is called a stretch needle. What it is, is at the tip of the needle, it's completely rounded. So think of a ballistic shape. So what that does, it will push fibers left and right, but not cut them. If you look at a knit, what I'm wearing today, a t-shirt, think t-shirt, it's not a knit like what my mother used to knit with needles, like big coarse yarn, but it's still a yarn if you want. It's not a twisted tight thread like a woven fabric. It's all these little tiny fibers that have been bundled and then knitted together. But a sharp needle can literally nick through those and you, uh, you'll get holes in your knit. Where the ballpoint needle, it will literally glide through and force those fibers aside and not ever nick the knit. Now, if you go over too many layers, a ballpoint needle will start thumping 
because it's got a blunt end, a rounded blunt end. And if you try to sew denim with a, a straight, you know, you, let's say you, you mended a t-shirt yesterday or you rehemmed a t-shirt and you forgot to change the needle, you go to sew some denim today, you're going to know. It's gonna thump like crazy. So in that case, just change the needle. So that's for the stretch needle. Uh, I often would use a size 75 or uh, 80 in that range to start with. It usually works very well. Um, the talking of size of needles, most of you I'm sure are familiar that when you see size 11 for 75 or 12 for 80, 11 and 12, that's wire gauge size. That's the old, the original system used here in the US. In the international system of measurements, they basically use the, 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 the decimal numbers if you want. 100 is a reference size for a sewing machine needle. So if my uh, needle here, for instance, my, gen, my jeans or denim needles were size 90, that needle is 90% as large or as big as this 100. It's 90% of size. So that's what those sizes mean. Next, so there's Microtex. If you do microfibers, think like really, really fine rayon. A jeans needle, the point is sharp. It will go through, give you a clean seam. But that point is a little big. It will, it may pull runs in that microfiber. Because microfibers, again, it's not a really big warp and weft anymore is these little bundles of very super fine fibers and those can be nicked again. Uh, you may not want to use a ballpoint or a, a stretch needle on those. It's not stretch material, but the microtex at such a fine point that it will go through without pulling runs in the fabric. I had once had to sew a project with a blouse on a luscious microfiber rayon and that's the only needle that would work. Now, some many of my colleagues love the microtex needle for finishing work because it gives you on linen, which can be coarse, on jute, on anything, it will give you a precise seam, whether it's edge stitching, top stitching, it will give you really beautiful. So if you wanna do like top stitching on the shirt, on the plackets, you could use a Microtex if you want the finest result, especially if it's a fine silk and a very fine cotton even for that matter. The thing to remember is that these are both sharp points. Denim, uh, or jeans, they used to be called sharp, by the way, then they were called jeans slash sharp, now they call jeans, right? Same. Uh, microtex is a finer point. It's a super fine long point. So the microtex point will wear out faster. I have colleagues who piece quilts with microtex. They love the precision. I prefer the jeans needle because I use uh, embroidery stabilizer behind my blocks. So that way the jeans needle lasts me the whole quilt where the microtex would probably not last me the quilt. So it's a more delicate point but it is the finest point for precision, depending on what your application is. If you're just top stitching one blouse, Microtex works great. If you already have a jeans needle and it's plain cotton, you can keep it on, it will work just as well, okay? Next, we have quilting needle. I piece with a jeans, a sharp needle, but I quilt, of course, with a quilting needle. And this is where the groove takes the action. The groove of a quilting needle is deeper. It's recessed further into the needle, so the thread can hide in there and flow protected. The reason is quilts have, when you do the quilt sandwich quilt, right? When you do the quilting stitch, quilts have that batting. Picture a, medium, a low loft cotton or even a high loft polyester. You have all these little fibers, the fiber fill, if you want, the, the loft. These are all little tendrils that will basically touch the thread as it's trying to slide in, you know, the, the, the thread and the needle slide off of each other. They both go like, they both go and slide against each other. So if you don't shelter that thread, the batting will get a hold of it along the length of the needle and it could interfere with the free flow, which means the pull up of the thread when the take up lever does its job may be incomplete, in, insufficient. It may not be completely successful. That would lead to a, a loop or a loose stitch. And sometimes it could lead to a missed or a skip stitch because when the needle starts retracting, if, if the thread doesn't form that loop properly on the bottom, you skip a stitch. So that quilting needle has a deeper groove to protect the thread. And uh, in the case of Schmetz, they round the very tip of it a little bit so that it will not poke and push batting through the backing fabric and all the way through the quilts, to the back you know, of the quilt so much. It will actually help prevent that issue. So it's been optimized for quilting. And the way the needle companies do it is they gradually will change the shape until they get the best results. So they do the research for you. That's good. So that's for quilting needles. Embroidery needles. 
I do a ton of embroidery. My last quilt had four million stitches on the front. I wear a lot of embroidery needles. So uh, there are different types. There's plain embroidery needles like Schmetz has, and they typically, for Schmetz, they come in two sizes, size 75, 11, or 90, 14. Uh, there's also titanium coated. Schmetz calls them Schmetz gold. That's titanium oxide that's been coated on the, on the surface of the needle that makes it more friction resistant. A typical garment like a blouse or shirt may have two to 5,000 stitches in it. A typical embroidery design has 5,000 to 20, 30,000 designs on it. So while it's easy for the machine because it's just straight up and down stitching, it's a lot of wear on the needle when you do embroidery. And if you're doing fills, for those of you embroidery, right? When you do fills, you're rubbing that needle against existing embroidery, typically polyester thread. So it's a lot of friction. So those needles, I pretty much, this is my go-to needle now, titanium coated needles. Uh, I have both a 75 and 90 in the Schmetz Gold. There's another needle that I use, I'll show in a minute, but these are traditional household style embroidery machine needles. So they're not commercial needles, you know, they, they work well with your home sewing machine. So if you embroider, let's say you made badges, and now you wanna sew them onto the garments, or on a bag or something, you could just switch to sewing mode and sew with that needle, no problem. There's another needle I use a lot. It's Organ, Organ brand. That's why I put it in the poll. Organ, uh, it's a Japanese company. They traditionally made needles for commercial embroidery machines. So they know their needles too. Uh, it's a, uh, this is called a titanium sharp. It comes in the green package and we'll say TS80, titanium sharp 80. It is a good size. If I do appliques in the, at the, at the embroidery machines, like in the hoop applique, this one's my go-to. It's just big enough to let that thread flow on the satin stitch at the edge, and it's not too big. Uh, a 90 needle for applique, I tried that first. The holes are too big. It will fray the edge of your applique. It will damage the applique. 80 was a better size. So 80 titanium sharp, that's my go-to needle for my embroidered quilts. The, it lasts for a long, long, long time. Uh, so does the Schmitz, by the way. But 80 was a good size for the type of quilts. I do a lot of triple stitch. Triple stitch is a little tricky because there's a lot of friction. You're going back in the same holes and you're rubbing polyester on polyester. You know when you put a polyester garment in the dryer, only one blouse, one pair of whatever, pair of shorts, whatever, there'll be a bunch of static in that load when you take it out. And polyester thread generates static as it gets rubbed 20,000 times in a design. So this size 80 titanium sharp, I love for embroidery for that because it gives me on the triple stitch especially, it prevents those loop stitches that were due to static. So one thing you need to know, there's nothing wrong with organ needles, but they are thicker than your traditional household style sewing machine. Just a hair thicker. In embroidery, complete non-issue because the computer moves the needle up, then moves the module. There's no helping hands. So the organ needles are perfect for embroidery, but you absolutely, on a Bernina, never sew, like sewing machine sewing with a feed dog in your hands, never, because it's thicker. Remember I said this, the scarf at the back of the needle, the hook comes and gets it, right? Gets the thread right behind the scarf. The hook to needle clearance, that's the distance between the hook and the needle on the Bernina is the tightest of any machine brand in the world. It's a tenth of a millimeter. It's tiny, tiny. You can barely piece, put a piece of paper between the two. That means it's hard to skip a stitch. Love that. But if you sew with an organ needle, and you know when you sew, you try to help the fabric along a little bit. You don't want it to you know, drag. So you keep moving with the fabric. You know what that does? It can flex the needles towards the back. If you flex that needle towards the back, you already had a very close distance between the hook and the needle. And now you have an organ needle that is a little bigger you may graze the hook. And then if you graze the needle, change the needle. If you graze the hook, call your tech. So, you know, they can polish that off, but it's gonna be a boo-boo. And while your hook is grazed, it, it won't sew right. So nothing wrong with the organ needles, but reserve them strictly for embroidery. No sneaking in the three inch seam in between. It's not worth the risk. If you don't wanna deal with that, use the Schmitz Gold. Schmitz Gold is a traditional shape, Home, embroidery, home machine needles. So this, you can sew a badge and then pull in even the module attached because on Berlin's you can sew with the module attached. If you have a seven or eight series, 
even a five new five series, the arm is long enough. You can park the module out, the arm of the module out, leave the module on, and sew a quick seam if you wanted to. So you could actually do this with the Schmitz needles, whether they uh, titanium, gold, or not. But embroidery needles from Schmitz, you can sew with. These are good for appliques. So when that's my go-to for applique. I just remember to absolutely take it down before I go sew anything. No damage done, right? So that's for the basic five. What I'm going to do now is show you a couple of online resources. But before we do that, let's uh, go to the second poll, Megan, which is about the types of needles you use the most. Just for my notes, Megan, are you able to tell when the, the poll is pretty much done? Yes, I can see what percentage of the attendees have voted. Okay. Okay, would you like me to close it and share the results? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Okay, so you had 47% said universal needles, 16% said jeans or sharp, only 3% said jersey or knits. Mm -hmm. You had 31% in that category of top stitch, microtex, or metafill, and then 4% in the embroidery, twin needle, or wing needle. Cool, cool. Yeah. All right, Universal was there, right? And you may have noticed, I have not mentioned Universal yet. <laughs> okay, when I started showing about Universal needles, hey, magic, they, they're good for everything. That's true, they're pretty good. Uh, I do not start with a universal needle almost ever. I have them in my sewing room as a backup. Universal needle. Remember I mentioned that the, the jean slash sharp is a sh sharp straight V point. And then the ball point is for knits. So if you don't sew knits, you don't need them, right? Those are rounded at the tip. They have this ballistic top. So those, those are optimized each for the particular type of sewing. The universal needle is a compromise. It is not a compromised needle but it is a compromise between sharp and ballpoint what they did is they took the, the 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 sharp point and they rounded the tip a little more than they would on an embroidery needle or a quilt needle so it's that it's kind of a halfway needle it's decent on cotton so you can sew shirts blouses i used to sew shirts with that on denim it will start thumping pretty early when you start adding layers, like the crotch seam insert. You know, after you put the zipper, you have the placket and all these layers, it will start thumping. So I have these in my sewing room in case as a backup, the universals, but they're, that they're a fallback option. If you're sewing on cotton with universals today, do yourself a favor, get yourself some jeans needle. They're not just for jeans. They're really a sharp point and that will give you actually crisper seams and it will give you better results on cotton and again i have these they're backup in case and i always have them in my travel little tool case when i go to teach or take a class or where an event anything i will have some universals in case because they're a good stand-in for the others they're not as good as the others but they will do a, a decent job as standing now uh, the uh, top stitch needle i have not mentioned it's not something everybody uses Top stitch needle has a very, very tall eye, very big eye, because it's supposed to handle the big yellow thick jeans thread. Now, I do not hem my jeans with the big thick jeans thread. I actually use isocord thread, which is polyester, flows well. I use a triple stitch instead. It looks the same when you're done. I can match any color of yellow thread that was on the existing, or gold, whatever, on the jeans. I don't have to, you know, pick one or the other, I can match the color and I can do this. So I don't use top stitch needles that often, but if you're gonna sew awnings, uh, you know, boat covers, heavy duty stuff, upholstery, top stitch is often the reference needle. And that application brings in the topic that normally if you have an application like this, like you wanna make an on, fix your awning for your porch, you could go online, do a search on how to fix an awning and all that stuff will be in there. Then you know what, not, what needle to go to. Sometimes you'll substitute a different needle. Uh, there's even a new needle from Schmetz. I've not used it yet, but Rod and my colleague sent me a sample. I'm going to try those. Nonstick, like your nonstick cookware. 
non-stick coated needles now. So think new print. You want to fix a wet suit, a dry suit. You want to, uh, you know, you want to fix something that has rubberized backing fabric, like uh, upholstery fabric. Sometimes those non-stick needles will not be gripped by that backing anymore. So those are my two tests, you know, to play with needles. Uh, so that's for that. And one more thing I want to cover before we wrap up is um, we have a needle threader built into just about every machine today, right? The needle threader on all the Berninas works from needle sizes 70 and above, so 11 and above. If you do heirloom sewing, you may use size 60, uh, size 8, or size 9, which is 65 needles. Those are too small for the built-in needle threader. Here's why. You have the eye of the needle, right? So you, uh, you have the eye of the needle. You have the needle threader that comes from the back, right? So it wraps around the back, and then there's this hook that comes through to the front. The hook is curved in, right? It's supposed to grab a thread and pull it through the eye of the needle. So when it pulls the loop through, there's two strands of thread. There's a metal curved hook, so it's not just a little rod. It's the, actually the, the, all the, the, the dimensions of the hook itself that all has to fit through the eye. Below a size 70, can't anymore. There's too much going on. So uh, if you have an 880, for instance, that does the auto, fully automatic or the eight, any 8 series, you want to, when you thread, there's a manual threading button on the screen. So when you thread the machines, you park your thread. Instead of pressing the go button for threading, you will touch the screen and say manual threading. It will thread the inside of the machine, take up lever and all that good stuff. And then it will stop. So it will not swing the threader on the 8 series and what it calls smack the lips against the needle and basically damage that little hook. Now, if you want to do manual threading, those of you who have a 12, 30, 11, 30, 16, 30, the, you know, that generation from 86 to 97, you know this needle threader. It was slotted, molded to the angle of the cover of the machine and slotted on the side, right? So you would just slide your finger, pull it out and thread. We still have this. I still use it because double needles, wing needles, leather needles, tiny needles below 70, none of those can have the, the will accommodate a needle threader. A double needle, the needles are here, the thread is coming in the middle, it will miss, right? A wing needle, the, the, remember the gray part, the plastic part at the top, at the bottom of the, or the tip rather of your thread that wraps around the back of the needle so that can position itself, it would smack into those wings. So don't want to damage anything, you would manual thread those. This is your tool. It's just a little, it's just a little thing. Now the, the tip of this one is when you lay the thread up in the front in that little slit here. You don't want to be tight. You just want to lay it down. You don't want to pull it through because it may miss. So that's it. I use still this little needle threader. So that's for that. Let's go back. I'm going to go back and show my screen. I want to show you a couple of online resources before we go to questions. So uh, let's go to the web browser. Can you see my screen, Megan? No, you're still oh. on your slideshow. Okay, it just, it just actually, I think, activated. Uh, show screen. Yeah, it says show screen is on pause. Can you see my screen now? You're, there you go. Yep, you're okay. good. So this is the blog post. The link is in the handout. So you can click right on the link. You don't need to write anything down now. This is the one that talks about the five basic needle types. It will give you size recommendations. There's tips in there. So that will give you a, a starter point. The handout from uh, from Schmetz will be very useful in recognizing what the different needles are for. And then if you go to the, and the link for this second one here, the Bernina needle search is on the handout as well. This is awesome. You can choose what machine type you have, what kind of fabric or material base you have, and what is your project, and it will recommend what kind of needle to use. So, and if you see all the individual types, for instance, that Bernina has some pro needles. I did not know that. I just found that out yesterday. The pro needles have basically a stronger shank. So uh, if you click on one of the needles, it will actually give you the detail on what that needle type is for, a little more information. So that is available. And at the top of this needle search page, there is a little down brochure you can download. A little tip here, that brochure, uh, let me go back to the camera now. That brochure is tiny little pages. 
So I printed it four pages in multiple when I print it's, I, I PDF it. It's a PDF basically, but it's tiny little sheets like cards that will go behind the needles, right? So I printed four per page so it would fit. It's also a good reference to have uh, in your needles folder. So that's for the needles. Uh, always pick the right type first because that determines all the, the anatomy that will make it work for you. If you start getting skip stitches and, or loopy stitches, especially loose loopy stitches, and you know you have the right type, then the next thing to try is to bump your needle size one up because it may be too tight in there. That will give you, uh, but if you start with the recommendations in the blog post, you typically you'll be okay to go. And for universal needles, remember they're good backup, but the dedicated type sharp or ballpoint will actually do a better job at what they do compared to a universal. So I keep that as a reserve needle. So that's for the basics. Uh, we're good for questions. Do we have questions? Of course we have questions, come on. Yeah, that's the fun part. Exactly, that's the best part about this. We had someone ask, how often should a needle be changed? Ah, oh my God, do you we have to, stories? You forgot to mention that, come on. I work at the main office in Chicago, right? We have received machines. Uh, we once got a machine that the lady said, we didn't send the machine back, the needle back. Her husband had been filing her needle for years. Oh no. So if you do a big project, pitch the needle. It's, you don't know what the quality of that needle is at that point. If you just applicate a badge on with a needle that you just put on after you did the badges, that needle's still good. So what I do is I took one of those tomatoes, they still sell those, and I, with a Sharpie, a marker, I wrote the types and the sizes. And you can do a top and a bottom half, so you, you get a lot of room. So, and I use like four or five types of needles all the time, so it wasn't that many. So I could actually mark them and stick them on there. Those are keepers, I can use them again. But if it's been, if I just made a pair of jeans with a jeans, uh, let's say 80 or 90 needle, I will, I will pitch the needle. If I made them, or if I made like a, a project with 80s and I just hand with a 90, I may keep the 90. But when I start a project, I, with the time and materials involved, a needle is about a buck, maybe a couple of bucks for the fancy ones. It's not worth skimping on the needle. So yeah, anyone in doubt, change. The needle if you and if you hear scratching sounds if you hear thumping not by needle yeah i don't i don't waste time on the needle yeah sure um can you kind of explain your reasoning or your the difference between using a jeans needle or a top stitch needle okay top stitch is when your thread gets really thick like if you're using that jeans thread you know the heavy stuff or if you're going through very very hard material denim is a twill Denim is actually a soft fabric. It's easy mm -hmm. enough for the needle to pierce through this and just go. Sure. But if you're doing oil canvas, you know how tight that is. And if you're hemming the edge of an awning and you have like double turn canvas because you want a little weight or curtains for that matter, you know, like I did a bay window curtain once for the living room, that stuff is heavy. Like not just heavy weight, weight, but heavy thickness and dense. Then the top stitch needle has that bigger eye and deeper groove and it offers free passage of the press. So I think of the top stitch needle as a heavy duty sharp needle, like ec extra heavy duty if you want. I will go to a jeans needle all the way to a size 100 often and that will take care of it for garments and stuff like that. Tote bag, you wanna do a nice triple stitch at the top of the tote bag where you may have had double turn fabric, you had a fusible fleece or bond agent in the middle plus a liner and now you put webbing to make it look party. That's a lot of layers. That's a lot of thickness. I may go to a top stitch needle there because that is your, it's like your all wheel drive needle. It will go through everything. It has a deep clearance for the thread and it gives you a nice, especially if it's a triple stitch because triple stitches on the way back and forth is where you're gonna loop stitches, especially if there's friction, right? Because polyester thread or even cotton thread for that matter, static will build up and interfere. So the top stitch needle there gives you extra clearance. Uh, it's just an heavy, extra heavy duty needle, needle rather. And actually, when you take a needle down, going back to the first question, when a needle is declared like, man, I don't trust you anymore, mm -hmm. I keep some of those. I, I have a cork board on my wall where I can pin samples and photos and stuff I want to make. I stick them there. That is my scoring needle. You know when you have like an embroidery stabilizer where you score the, waxy, the, the wax paper layer to peel off? I never use a pin for that. Number one, I will scrap the pin, right? It will bend. Number two, the pin will bend. When you bend the pin, you don't know how much pressure you're putting down because the pin mm -hmm. is absorbing some of that. The sewing machine needle is stiff, stiffer. 
it, you know exactly how much pressure. So when you, you and you get used to how much you want to do, when you go do your X and you surround the hoop, for instance, you know exactly. I never go through my stabilizer anymore because I, that needle works better. So busted sewing machine needles are great scoring needles. We did have someone else ask, what's the most environmentally conscious way of disposing of your needles? That okay. are they, most of them are just steel. Mm -hmm. So they can go they can go into the recycle bin with your food cans, right? Uh, you may want to keep, uh, you know, you don't need to do this very often. You could keep, a, you know, if you have a little uh, tiny container, a busted container that had a lid, just, you know, cut a, like a needle uh, with a punch, whatever, cut a hole in it and use it, mark it clearly. Mm -hmm. waste needle waste don't touch you don't want the kids to play with that right keep it on a high shelf whatever but you could collect those and once in a while just pitch them you know mm -hmm. uh, you could put them in a small you know they, they will go to recycling you just if you i put them in recycling when i have a, enough i label that those are, because i don't know how this gets sorted but if it's steel chances are it'll be picked up by the equipment at the processing facility so yeah cool we did have a couple people want a recommendation on what type of needle you would use or what type and size of needle you would use when you're just piecing regular quilt tops with just regular quilting cotton. Yes, yes, yes. And this, I've said it before, I will say it again. I went to consult the Oracle of Wisconsin. <laughs> My colleague, Nana McVeigh, she is the exquisite piecer. She teaches quilting for us. She's, the, she's our quilting lady, right? So the recommendation, and write this down, it's actually in the blog post, but it's jeans, sharp needle, size 17. Which means you can use the needle threader. There you go. There <laughs> you go. Part. And that that is good for your ba your basic, whether it's fifty weight or. But the thing is that it's a small hole, a small hole, so you get a crisp mm -hmm. seam that way. It's a sharp point, so you, again it promotes a crisp seam. And if I piece, oh, this is the secret sauce. That's me now. Uh, I piece at a stitch length of one point seventy five for basic regular quilting cotton. Okay. That stitch is short enough that it doesn't pucker fabric, but it is close enough that you don't pop your first and last stitch when you open your seam allowances. They stay pieced. I, I, I formulated that approach with garment making way back mm -hmm. because you know, in certain scenes, you don't want them to pop when you, you, know, when you, you go over the pressing ham and you're kind of poking that seam around with the iron and you're shaping it out. So that shorter stitch, 1.75. And if you have a current touchscreen Bernina, well, Bernina since 97, you can store that stitch at that length. And you can even override the default straight stitch. If you piece all the time, you could override the straight stitch or a computerized Bernina since 97, where you, that you can program. There's a video on Facebook, Bernina USA on Facebook, that mm -hmm. talks about just that. And I do this on my machines. I boot, it's 175 when I'm making a quilt. There you go. Can you talk a little bit about how thread size fits into what needle size you're supposed yes. to be using? So I mentioned the eye. Remember the thread goes through the eye of the needle in a V shape. like. The needle's down here, but the thread's being pulled back and forth through the eye 15 times at stitch length 2.0 <laughs> for the, the fabric I was using, right? So uh, the size of the needle will, well, the, the sh well, all three, the groove, the eye, and the size of the needle, okay? The needle type helps. If you're doing basic cotton, ba basic thread for a quilt top, you're not using funky stuff. If you're going to the jeans thread, the heavy stuff for hemming a tote bag, it's great on tote bags, on jeans. You, if you go to a top stitch needle, you have just made the groove, gotten a bigger, deeper groove, a bigger eye, which means the, the same 90 size needle would sew a forward seam with that heavy thread where the jeans needle may start looping up a little bit. So I would, you know, the type is first. The type presets the, the advantages on all three, groove, eye, and um, even the back, the scarf. So that way, if you have the right type, you can up the size once. If that doesn't work, then revisit the type. And then I would upgrade a sharp to a uh, top stitch. Ball point, you typically don't get knits that are this thick. This is denim territory. It's usually woven canvas and stuff like that. So uh, I consider top stitch an upgrade. Or if you, do a, if you want to do decorative stitching, little floral stitches on a canvas your bernina will do it it doesn't care how are your top stitch because that extra clearance on your thread means less stress resistance friction your uh, decorative stitches flowers thing leaves things like that because you go around curves and funny shapes the, the needle is sewing in all sorts of directions remember the directional needle doesn't like so much going all sorts of direction the only exception to that really is embroidery 
Because embroidery, the computer waits until the needle is out before it moves the module. But, and then this is where my little research background comes in handy. Uh, this is when the brain goes, mm, okay, what now? You'll get those. I teach a workshop that has directional uh, on the 45 degrees, all four, triple stitch with an embroidery needle. Okay? I would get loops on certain machines when it goes from Seattle to Miami. And I'm like, what's wrong? So I try, try, try. Well, it turns out the embroidery needle did not like to do triple stitch in that particular direction at that stitch length. Like, lucky me, right? So I experimented, and it turns out that the jeans needle, same size, worked just fine in embroidery on the module with that triple stitch. So experiment and never exclude experimentation. If you know that triple stitch worked just fine, I hand my jeans with this, a jeans needle with polyester thread, right? I use isocord. Triple stitch. Well, if it worked on jeans, I thought, wow, it might work on the embroidery. And it didn't. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was lucky. So you never know. Sometimes, remember that needle, all needles are directional. They love front to back. They love straightforward stitching. So when you ask them to do 360, like an embroidery, there will be very specific cases where the needle falls short. It did everything else, but it can't do that one little thing. So then for that particular design, I would use the jeans needle. You know, that's uh, so don't get discouraged. The uh, the Schmetz needle guy would help you. It's a nice at a, uh, at a glance, bird's eye view of all the different types. So I keep that one handy. It's it's pegged to the cord cord. And if I'm at computer ne next to me, the burning the needle uh, selector is uh, right at hand as well. Okay, the next couple, I just want quick fire answers from okay. you. Just all right. cool. <laughs> first thing that comes to your mind, it's 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 recommendations or yeah. things that you okay. would suggest. So. First, what is your go-to? I always have it on hand needle. Uh, well, for the work I do, jeans, 80. Perfect. What is your recommended needle for metallic threads? Oh, metafill. You know, meta means metallic, fill is thread. The reason it has a, a tall eye that is smooth, so it will not shred the metallic thread. But I have to expand a little bit. Not all metallic threads are created equal. Right, mm -hmm. and there's no representational brands here. But let's say sulky metallic is a filament, which means when you sew with it, it sparkles. It's pure metal, but it's not thread. It, you know, it's used as a thread, but it's not thread. Uh, yen net, which is yen like Japanese yen, met for metallic. That is like a polyester. Core. That's a polyester core, like isocord, wrapped with metallic. So that will flow through an embroidery machine for that. You know, I've done standalone lace with it. You could mm -hmm. not with the filament one so depending on your applications i would still use a metallic needle uh, if you use metallic needles by the way in embroidery uh, sorry metallic thread in embroidery like let's say even yen mat you want a ballpoint needle because that okay. point could cut into the metallic and and snap it so you want a ballpoint needle for that uh it works much better in embroidery for metallic okay and last one what is your go-to needle for embroidery like if you're Okay. Yes. Oh, another crush. shout out to my colleague, Judy Hainer, who mm -hmm. uh, her daughter owns a commercial embroidery company, right? She does like tons of shirts and stuff. So she uses the E16, you know, the commercial machine. And she told me her stop, her start go-to needle is, uh, in her case, a Schmetz 75 embroidery needle. It's the right size for most embroidery designs. If that doesn't work, and there's two types of embroideries, the ones who test and the ones who don't. So if you test first and you get some loops up, the, up, you can up the size to a 90. Or in this case, for me, I had the in-between size with the 80 titanium sharp. So either way, but I start with a 75. And really, Schmetz Gold is my go-to embroidery needle now. Mm -hmm. I, I learned that from experience. It will last about five times longer than a regular needle. And it will maintain top performance almost until the end. It will, it will start failing, and you'll notice, and then you're done. A regular needle will kind of fail gradually and you don't notice until you see oh, where do these loops come from. So size 75 embroidery, my preference is titanium coated. Okay, and final question. I gotta find the best one here, hold on. <laughs> She's trying to trick me. <laughs> I'm, just I'm not trying to trick you, I just. Ooh. Okay, this is uh, for a unique fabric. Okay. Um, what would you recommend if someone is because you, you know you're embroidery you you know how to do that um what needle would you recommend for like a sticky fabric um for embroidery okay uh actually the um titanium coated needles are less prone to sticking so that's okay. good 
uh, uh, Schmitz now has a Teflon needle. It may work. I would, it, it, I would warrant a test. But I would start with a, uh, an, a smaller needle, like a 75, if it will work. Uh, the Schmitz Gold Titanium 75. The smaller needle has more of a chance of escaping friction because the circumference, if you want, of the, 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 the perimeter of the needle is smaller. So it might be able to go through there better. Mm -hmm. you, but then if it's really sticky against your thread, you may need to go to a 90 embroidery needle that will offer more clearance, make a bigger hole so the thread can you know, avoid the sticky. It, it will take experimentation there. I would run, I would run the, the design, like portions of it on the on the swatches of the fabric with the three needles. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that answers pretty much all the questions we had. Uh, Sylvain, did you have anything else you wanted to wrap up with? No, that is, it's just the right needle. So uh, the resources on the handout, that's really what helped me. And uh, the needle is everything. The machine can be fancy or simple, but it's the needle that delivers the thread to the stitch. So uh, it's and lucky for us, though, we have a, everything available nowadays. We have such a variety. So uh, there's always the right needle for the job. So that, that's the big plus. There you go. Well, thank you, Sylvain. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. In a couple of days, the recording to this and the handouts will be posted on Bernina.com. You'll click on the Learn and Create tab in the top right corner, then click on Classes and then Webinars. And you can find all our past recordings in the recording Recorded Webinars tab. If you have any other questions that we didn't get answered today, feel free to email me and I can get those passed on for you and we'll hopefully get them answered. On behalf of Bernina, thank you very much for joining us. See ya. <laughs> oh, yeah.